Okay, so welcome everybody to our Ecolops talk today. I'm very happy to introduce Sarah Bekesi from Ahmed University in Melbourne. Ahmed means Royal Royal Oh Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. I practice so hard and now I say. Uh, so it's actually um, quite similar to TUM in the sense that so they have architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning, but also have other technology. So it's a technical university. And um, I have known Sarah for a little bit of time now. Uh, Sarah is a very impressive researcher who also connects extremely well to the urban planning practice. So she started off as an ecologist um, with a degree in ecology um, at the, um, uh, and a PhD at the University of Melbourne. And then she also started to encompass more and more um, social sciences and now has quite a number of projects where she thinks about how we can improve biodiversity conservation or human nature interactions in cities. And in this, she is very close to the topic of ecolops, or maybe we are very close to her topic in um, really thinking about how we can design the future cities that um, um, take into account nature more using um, um, yeah, other organisms such as animals as stakeholders. And Sarah has a concept that she will introduce biodiversity sensitive urban design. And um, today she will give us an overview over her various research project and also the the concepts about how, what could be objectives in, in this biodiversity sensitive urban design. In Ecolops, we, we have discussed this a lot. So what is, a, what is an ecological objective? Um, how, what should we aim for? And um, I'm looking very much forward, um, Sarah, to your talk. Oh, okay, no problem. And then it's so, yeah. Yeah. And then it's best one. Yeah. So she just see oops. Yeah, I think that's great. Hi everyone here and on the screen. <laughs> it's um it's a great pleasure to be here to be invited to present. I really appreciate the, the invitation. Actually, I just wanted to thank Wolfgang in particular for inviting me for these few um, days that I've been here. And I have really loved meeting the, your group. Um, and I think we've had some really inspired conversations. We've started two papers, you know, <laughs> together, which I think is pretty good going for only a few days. <laughs> but that's evidence of just how many ideas we're exchanging, I think. And, you know, to have two kind of groups working on pretty similar ideas in two quite different parts of the world, um, both with interdisciplinary academics sort of throwing themselves at the problem, I think has been um, a really a, a great uh, intersection. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our work in cities. We do other sorts of work in, in rural areas. We, we work with uh, in psychology and message framing, and we work with health professionals looking. Uh, in fact, I just came from a really interesting project, uh, European project in Tyrol, where it's called Resetas, which is looking at using nature based social prescribing to treat loneliness. So you go to your health professional, you're lonely, and instead of giving you some Prozac or whatever, <laughs> they'll tell you to go and meet some friends in the, in the park, but actually in a coordinated way. And this project's actually trying to create an evidence base for that approach being a legitimate health um, activity. Uh, and so, yeah, my part in that is actually understanding what the dose of nature is that people are getting in this setting, which has also been a really intriguing um, thing to have to, to throw myself into. But yeah, today I'm gonna to focus on our work in cities and in, particularly, in particular, our biodiversity sensitive urban design protocol. And you know, I don't think I need in this with this audience to really justify why we should be doing this, um, which is usually what I spend half of my talks doing, to be perfectly honest. 
but um, it's refreshing to know that you all are aware that uh, you know the world is facing unprecedented challenges and cities are kind of a you know a sort of real center of, of, of those challenges in some respects climate change you know pandemics overpopulation how do we keep people healthy happy safe connected positive in in these kinds of environments it's a it's a major challenge and more and more we're looking to in you know green <laughs> uh, and biodiversity less and less, less perhaps than just green but Certainly green is on the agenda in a major way. We're seeing massive global investment in getting cities, in making cities green and inviting nature back in. And you know, the, the, the benefits of doing this are now extremely well evidenced and they're remarkable. I still find them remarkable to this day. The list of health benefits that you can achieve just by having a 30, 30 minute dose of nature every day. Um, the idea of being able to cool our cities dramatically. Melbourne, we think we've cooled the city by eight degrees through the implement in the hot nights when people tend to die in cities like Melbourne in a heat wave. Eight degrees is a massive achievement through an urban forest strategy. Uh, the idea that we can actually help threaten species thrive and survive and actually reverse their fate. I mean, this is a real ambition of mine, but it's certainly, why not? All this investment, let's get on the bandwagon and actually give biodiversity a chance as well. And I think a really important aspect of all of this is allowing people to become re-enchanted with nature in the places where they're living and they're working, and they're playing and they're traveling. That's a huge as underplayed aspect of having and, and place making, making a place uniquely its own. Um, and it's very easy in Australia, but I think it would be really just as easy here to use vegetation to tell cultural stories and traditions and connect people with those through just experiencing them every day. And of course, something that we have that's really special about Australia is the opportunity to use this agenda to promote reconciliation with First Nations Australians. And this is a big agenda in Australia now. The idea that we can have culturally, um, a culturally important vegetation, plants, and actually, and animals in our everyday urban environment, we understand those stories, we respect those stories, and we empower Indigenous Australians to be part of the urban greening agenda through including them in in committees, including their knowledge in, in the way that we plant and the way that we create our gardens, uh, having urban ranger programs for Indigenous people. This is actually happening. <laughs> urban caring for country. Caring for country is an a Indigenous Australian concept that is really about um, embracing you know, the landscape as part of your family and reading it in a, in a really time kind of way, quite a different way than the way that uh, conservation biologists are trained to understand landscapes. So this is, this is a really amazing opportunity that we have with, with urban greening. And I don't think it's just relevant to places like Australia with a strong First Nations history. I mean, we were discussing, you know, how Friesen could be doing the same thing to reflect your history and your culture and your, you know, quite unique landscapes in, in cities so that you walk into the street and you know it's rising because in part because of the vegetation I mean obviously you've got pretty special buildings too here but uh, um, but you know we we also know that we're not always in fact I would say rarely especially after just having a conversation with Andrew about a recent paper that he read um, capturing this opportunity this is a study that we undertook a few years ago now but I think it's still relevant and it looked at how uh, cities around the world were tackling climate change. Green infrastructure is up there as a third most uh, invested approach to tackle climate change. And yet hardly any of these reports actually even mentioned the word biodiversity. So we're, you can fill a city with trees. You can fill a city with vegetation and have very little benefit for biodiversity. And that is the problem that we are currently facing. We need intentional strategies. We need to be really strategic about capturing this opportunity and this investment for biodiversity. Because if we don't, we, have, we stand to lose a lot. In Australia, but also globally, cities can actually be hotspots for biodiversity. It's a 
philosophical lecture that could really last 45 minutes on its own. Why this is the case is always is intriguing to me. Why cities are so full of threatened species. Um, but whatever the reason, they are. And these are this is just a map of a few species that only occur in cities in Australia. But the same can be said, I know, uh, in cities in, in Germany. Um, and there are a lot of species that have become dependent on resources in cities because they aren't nowhere else. Or we have modified cities to the point that they have become suitable habitat. There's a really interesting phenomenon in Melbourne where fruit bat, big fruit eating bat, with wingspan can be about this big, quite big, beautiful bats. They never used to occur in Melbourne because it's too cold, it's not wet enough, and there isn't enough food. We have heated the city through urban heat island. We water all of our parks and gardens and we've planted fruit trees everywhere. And now it's perfect bat habitat, <laughs> whether we want them or not. No, they're wonderful animals. They do smell a little bit, but they are fantastic, charming things. And you see them flying across the night sky. Um, and it's, it's actually quite impressive. But we have modified cities sometimes so that they are ha havens threatened species. These bats don't have anywhere else to go. We've cleared so much of their habitat. But we also know that it's enlightened self-interest to be doing biodiverse greening because it's just so much better than greening on its own. Uh, and I think the health benefits, I, I think, are probably the most compelling reason why we should be bothering in this space. It's been so fascinating with Rosetta's understanding the ins and outs of what makes a park a better dose of nature. And I've looked at all the literature on this and it's, it's really fascinating literature. But these are all things that have been well documented that are linked to biodiverse, biodiversity, not just green, but biodiversity. Improving your mood, re reducing fatigue, reducing crime, <laughs> connecting to identity. That's such an underplayed benefit. Um, but also just the the heart disease, diabetes, cancer. I mean, it's, as I said, enlightened self-interest to be focusing in on this area. And there's some really interesting new research coming out of Adelaide in Australia that's linking the benefits of native vegetation in parks to our immune system. And the thing that we think for the pathway is through the soil microbia. But what a fascinating thing that's actually not just vegetation, it's native vegetation that's actually potentially the thing that's leading to these kind of remarkable health benefits. And then I think, as I mentioned before, the idea of placemaking. This could only be a Melbourne street because these species only really occur in Melbourne. <laughs> but it's so fabulous. These residents have taken it upon themselves to create these beautiful pocket parks in roundabouts. And you know that you're in Melbourne because of the vegetation. Likewise, this is a beautiful street, um, quite a high density residential street in Adelaide. They dug up, this is a, they had the same problem as you, they would have to dig up the pages <laughs> in, in, uh, in this street. And instead of just putting, putting it back, they created this extraordinary biodiversity corridor through the street. And it, not just with native vegetation, but with water, logs, you know, nesting boxes. And it's now like the houses in this street are worth a bomb <laughs> because it's just so utterly enchanting and wonderful and so Australian. As I said, the idea of connecting with Indigenous history and culture is a huge theme in, in, our, in our country. And I, I'm just going to give this example I, I talked about the other day. This is an unfortunately named common brown butterfly that once used to emerge in huge numbers in Melbourne at the start of one of the Wurundjeri Seven Seasons. And so the, the enchanting idea is that we can actually bring this butterfly back and we can have that cultural experience of the butterfly returning in great numbers, recognize this, the part of the season that we are in, the connection with country. And there's just so many tick boxes of wins in that story. <laughs> but, you know, bringing us back to reality, that beautiful vision that I just portrayed is not really how we tend to do things in Australia. And, and I don't think it's necessarily typical in many countries in Europe that I've been visiting either. It's the exception rather than the rule. We still have many types of urban development happening that are quite incompatible <laughs> with my vision of a nature rich, you know, enchanting place. 
and they think like big cars and big cars. <laughs> this is actually on top of a critically endangered grassland, just to kind of like make the point a little stronger. Um, we have we have a lot to a lot of things to tackle. You know, the way the fundamental way that we do development, the urban form that we're accepting in our cities. You talked to Andrew about the urban fringe expansion that's happening in Germany. Well, it's really happening in Australia, and it's our cities are now enormous in terms of their footprint, and they're they're not great places to live. They're socially um, problematic. People have spent most of their lives driving. Uh, social services, public transport are rotten. It's <laughs> they're just I. It's beyond me that we're still growing our cities in this way. So we've got to tackle some pretty fundamental stuff to get nature on the agenda. The other thing we've got to tackle, I'm going to just try and do it quickly, even though it's a personal bugbear and an absolute passion of mine is, say no to offsetting. <laughs> this is not going to succeed in cities in delivering this, this vision of, of sustainability. And I think no slide that I've ever seen has told, uh, told me and spoken to me as to why offsetting doesn't work. That's this one. This is an Indigenous man standing on the edge of a highway in Melbourne, and they're going to be, I don't know if they've actually cut them down yet, but they're expanding this highway to be, to be a dual carriageway. These trees are 600-year-old trees that women have actually called birthing trees because they have a big cavity. And women have given birth in these trees for potentially, you know, hundreds of years. And the answer to their problems is that we're going to be offsetting these trees. Uh, I, I just don't think I need to say anymore. <laughs> it's such a ludicrous concept in terms of social uh, equity, in terms of ecological folly. I mean, how, how we can actually create recreate habitat, especially when you look at this. How can we ever recreate that? That is completely unique and place-based. And that's an extreme example. But... I would argue that every patch of habitat is extremely unique and place-based and its values are and, uh, because people walk past it every day and they love it. Or people play, kids play in that tree and it's really a big part of their childhood. And that kind of, can, that place-based value of nature is something that offsetting is never, ever, ever going to um, replace. Not to mention the fact that what we tend to do, we did some evidence a bit of a bit of research on this topic is clear in cities and offset well outside of cities where it's cheaper and easier and out of out of sight potentially so we're taking the natural heritage of the heritage of our cities and putting it elsewhere which you know all those benefits i described how can we deliver those with this kind of approach so say no to offsetting and offsetting is also not compatible with the global shift towards nature positive, which I, I find a really exciting kind of new paradigm. This was, did you, know, did you notice this Target 12 in the uh, recent COP? If you didn't, go and have a look. It's really exciting. Mainstreaming, it's actually about increasing the area and quality and connect, connectivity and access to the benefits of green and blue spaces in cities mainstream and conservation, sustainable use of biodiversity, ensure biodiversity inclusive urban planning, enhancing native vegetation, ecological connectivity, integrity, improving. Anyway, it's, it's kind of what we will never have to have another introductory slide to our talk. This is just fabulous news. But that offsetting is not going to deliver that. And actually everything that I've seen that's kind of new and innovative in this space is, is moving away from offsetting. This is actually a really interesting new policy that's about to be implemented in the UK. This idea of probably there might be some people from the UK online who could talk about this, but um, it's a new net gain policy, but it's actually focused on on-site benefits to biodiversity and development. In case I haven't convinced you totally that offsetting is out. <laughs> um, the, a lot of companies now are recognising that offsetting is a reputation risk because every assessment of offsetting shows that it doesn't achieve its goals of kind of having even maintaining biodiversity value. We tend to really lose biodiversity values. And so because organisations and companies are now going to be asked to disclose their biodiversity risks or biodiversity loss risks, um, offsetting is being 
firmly put into the kind of risk category. So I think, I hope we're going to see a lot of companies moving away from offsetting as the solution to their biodiversity problem. And in fact, let me just end on that note. The one, the one thing that I really can't stand about offsetting is it makes biodiversity a problem. It's like, oh, well, we've got this biodiversity. We're going to have to clear it and offset it. But, you know, what we want to do is frame biodiversity as a massive apps asset that we should be maximising at every step of the design and, and planning process. So offsetting is not going to deliver that either. So we, we think we need something different. I'm sure everyone on this call would agree we need... We, we call it onsetting, <laughs> but the idea is how we kind of use design to enhance the on-site values of biodiversity so that every development ends with a better biodiversity outcome than when it began. And we've got a paper on this if you want to have a look at it in a bit more detail, but it's really a scientifically deriv derived process. Uh, very much like the animal aided, aided design process that is very focused on improving the persistence of native species and ecosystems uh, on site in development. This is the team, Holly, myself, Georgia, Casey and Tami. And these are some of our partners. We actually have a lot more, but these are our main ones. Some are philanthropists who recognize that it's worth kind of trying to mainstream stream this idea. Others are big developers. We've got a city that's actually legislated for our protocol, which is pretty cool. Um, we've got a big engineering company and also the Green Building Council of Australia who are really keen to adopt and um, produce guidelines for how we do this. So I would like to, um, to spend the next little bit talking about what biodiversity sensitive urban design is, what the approach represents, and give you some case studies of uh, work that we've been doing uh, to demonstrate that it can actually sort of uh, be implemented. But then obviously some of the challenges, which I'm sure are sort of shared challenges. Like with anima animal aided design, it's built around you know, classic kind of ecological principles of what do you want to do if you want, if you want things to persist, you want to create habitat, maintain habitat, facilitate dispersal, minimize threats, and we have some big anthropogenic threats in Australia, but I know you, you do too here in Germany. Facilitating natural processes. This is something that I was actually really gobsmacked to hear that in Germany it's illegal to burn your ecosystems because in Australia, all ecosystems, well, not all ecosystems, so many ecosystems require burning to actually be sustained. Some require burning every five years. That's like the grasslands on the urban fringes of Melbourne. If you don't burn them, for 20 years, they can actually go over a bit of an ecological edge and it's really hard to get them back into good condition. So imagine that as a kind of challenge for you designers out there. How do you design a city where it's okay to burn your vegetation every five years? <laughs> and then obviously facilitating positive interactions with people. So it's just very similar to animated design, got a series of steps from documenting your values, thinking about your objectives, identifying your actions and then assessing how they're going to achieve your goals. Let me just take you through a few of those things. So documenting values, I think this is kind of something that usually you pay a consultant, you know, $10,000 to do, maybe less, because perhaps it's thought of as being a really simple exercise. But in, in my opinion, it's one of the more kind of complex um, steps. I mean, you can you could just say, well, this is a pretty dismal map of the vegetation that's left in Melbourne. And maybe just say, well, that's all we can go with here. We're just going to try and maintain what we've got. Um, obviously, you'd like to look at, you know, what, what species are there? What's the landscape context? Are there any special features? Um, what's their spatial arrangement? And how are they connected? And, you know, try and work with that. But, you know, hopefully everything I've said so far is, is making you appreciate that nature positive is demanding way more than that. This is a bit of a definition that we have adapted from uh, EJ Milner Gulland, who wrote that nature positive is about ensuring that nature is visibly and measurably on the path to recovery. So thinking about it in a really uh, clear and measurable way, having your baseline, having your time frame for achieving your goals, 
having a target, clear set of actions, how you're going to get there, and monitoring. So that's that's what nature positive is. It's not it's not just a kind of um, ethereal sort of you know, concept that you can just sort of say let's aim for it. It's actually something that we need to make clear and measurable. If we're going to do that, we need to do way more than just protecting the pittance that we have left. And so we've been working with Adelaide, for example, in the, our nature positive Adelaide plan <laughs> to look at what was the vegetation of Adelaide, you know, in recent times or in kind of way historic times. And what are the values from that that we want to try and retain, create, bring back? Do we want to try and reflect? This is Adelaide years gone by and these beautiful colitrous, um, geo, um, sort of swamplands. Um, I mean, maybe there's some beautiful to me. This is Australian, that's really beautiful. Do we want to try and recreate these kind of habitats and ecosystems in some way, or at least give a nod to them <laughs> in, our, in our urban design? Think about the species that once thrived there. Or sometimes they can be really um, human centric. This is a, something that really got people going, was thinking about this activity that used to happen every year, a big swim along the torrents. You would have to be mad to swim in the, in the torrents these days. It is disgusting. But it happened. We can do it again. It's a human-centric objective and value, but it's actually something that really appealed to people. And to achieve it is going to have to take a lot of revegetation and amazing innovation. But what a great way of talking to the public. Let's make your river a place where you can swim again. Sometimes understanding the values of your site can take a lot of time and be very, very intensive. And our colleague who we work with, Maro Baracco, he designed this house called Garden House. It's quite well known now. I actually walked into this building and thought, wow, there's similarities with the garden house. It's beautiful. He and his wife, Louise, camped on this site on and off for three years, I believe, to try and understand the animals and the plants how they use the site. They watch the blue tongue lizard in particular. Do you know these blue tongue lizards? They're big lizards about this big with blue tongues. They watch them move across the landscape and they knew that animals are kind of just like us. They have classic paths that they like to take. And they built their house so that the blue tongue lizards can still use exactly the same path that they like to use and they still use it. <laughs> it's so awesome. So that's that's how Maro would like the world to understand values. Everyone should camp on their site for three years, <laughs> understand everything that's there, and then design for it. Well, that's wonderful. Obviously, we can't all do that, but I think it's a nice sort of uh, objective to uphold, at least trying to understand values in that way. Okay. Let's move on to objectives, which are linked to values. So it's getting really clear about what we wanted to achieve with this project. And again, it's highly complicated. <laughs> and you can try and reflect all sorts of different values in choosing your species and objectives. I believe that you guys in Ecolopes are talking about this challenge a lot. Um, there's a really interesting paper, or uh, kind of report, I think it's IPBES again, that talks about nature for nature, nature for society, and nature for culture. And I think we can reflect all three of those types of nature in our objectives. Conservation values, obviously, are to do with nature for nature. Nature for society would be really about, you know, economic utility and maybe the social acceptability. And then the nature for culture, really thinking carefully about what you can achieve in terms of cultural significance. One of the things that's probably really quite good to recognise is there's no such thing as a correct objective, I don't think. Would you agree? I don't think there is a right objective for a project. Um, and it's something that, you know, we can just as designers or as ecologists just give hand people on a plate, here are your objectives. But it's a far more powerful thing to work with your stakeholders and bring a shared vision around objectives. And that's something that we've had, I, I think, a fair bit of success in doing, but it takes time and effort. Let me give you a quick example. This is a case study of Fisherman's Bend in Melbourne, a huge urban renewal project that's going to fit many thousand new uh, residential homes and a new employment district, a new kind of university district, 
it's massive and it's an old industrial site not very much vegetation to start with but the history is fascinating it's actually a place of immense cultural value it used to be where the kind of different groups aboriginal groups of melbourne would congregate and meet trade have parties it's a actually a beautiful bend in the river you can see here semi-tidal it would have been covered in mangroves which are actually beautiful these white mangroves it's the most southern mangrove area in Australia but there are only very very few mangroves left so you know obviously thinking about ecology in a site like this is would not have been done probably even 10 years ago I would argue wouldn't you agree we wouldn't have had an ecology plan for an industrial site that was going to be turned into housing so that's something to celebrate. They came to us and said, we want an ecology plan for this site. What can we achieve? And so we brought together stakeholders from across the, the board, um, traditional owners, uh, the water authorities, the electricity authorities, the transport authorities, community groups, um, future residents, people who had already bought into the site, some of the businesses that were going to occupy the site, anyone we could find who had a kind of an interest in a stake in this in this site and we we worked with them to come up with a vision for what it would be what would, if we'd succeeded in actually delivering a great ecology plan for this site what would it look feel smell sound like under a bunch of different scenarios got them to imagine that they owned a business or they had a kid always going to sports or they were walking through to their campus um or they were taking a break from their job in a you know corporate and we actually came up with these quite beautiful I think objectives for the site a place that honors indigenous culture a place with seven seasons a place known for its diverse ecosystems a place for the senses a place of shifting waters a place that's comfortable and beautiful in any weather these actually became objectives for the whole site not just the ecology plan which is a really lovely outcome uh, but we then our job was to connect if we're going to achieve these things what kind of ecological objectives would you need to think about if it's going to be a place of for the senses can we have colors sensations scents sounds frogs and birds that are calling that we can hear and your kids can hear and they all know what they are um so connecting these kind of quite human-centric objectives to eco ecological objectives and then work, work, workshopping those until we came up with a list of things that we could all agree were really exciting kind of list of things. So some of them are stretch goals. Like, I don't know if the Volga is ever going to return to Fisherman's Bench. If it does, you'll probably hear about it because I'll be yelling at the top of my lungs in a very excited way. But I actually are in the region, so it's not completely impossible. But just tricky. But other, other the really interesting one, this beautiful blue band of bees that is you know, totally charming. It's completely doable, a biodiversity goal for this site. It would just mean planting the right plants, creating a, a sort of you know linkages with the nearby areas that already have the bees. Anyway, that was how we kind of tend to go about generating our objectives now. I better go quickly, I think. Then this is the fun bit, the design stuff. Actually working out you know, how the heck are you going to get a blue tongue lizard to be able to survive in a, you know, what would otherwise be a total concrete jungle? What resources does it need? What food and habitats to thrive? And can we provide it either through, you know, classic habitat or through habitat analog? What are the threats it's going to face? Obviously, cars. Um, but probably light, probably sound pollution, all sorts of threats, and definitely cats and dogs. That is a huge issue in Australia. One single cat that people have in their house, but they let them out to go kind of um, foraging, <laughs> can kill up to 110 native animals every year. So it's a huge threat that people perhaps don't recognise. But one of the, the big kind of issues that we're trying to tackle with biodiversity sensitive urban design is how we how people handle their pets so that they're not a threat to nature. Uh, connectivity, how we kind of create, how we reduce the barriers to movement, is there other ways we can design around them? And then obviously the, the human nature interactions. So just a few ideas around the resources. Obviously, there's a lot of classic resources that you can provide. I mean, I see it here, but certainly in Australia, it breaks my heart 
when you walk down the street and you see one single tree, sometimes usually a plane tree, just planted every, you know, three meters apart if you're lucky. And that's the that's the kind of resources of the street. <laughs> you know, it's so unadventurous and so missing huge ecological niches. So we like to think about providing, oh, this is another case study that we were working with. It's more uh, uh, urban fringe development, looking at kind of providing uh, native ground covers. So instead of grass lawn, we have these beautiful enchanting um, examples of understory that are native. Then mid-story, that's something that is missing in so many cities, isn't it? And yet it's so critical for so many species and it's beautiful and enchanting. Let's bring the mid-story back to streetscapes of the world. I'd love to see that. So that just means thinking carefully about the kind of species that can thrive under the canopies that you've, you've created. Um, we actually developed a tool that is not published yet, but it's um, being tested by developers to try and understand what kind of resources you need to provide over time. And can you identify gaps in the resources that you've planned? We call them hunger gaps <laughs> and fill them by actually planting a different palette of species or you know, changing the, the diversity that you have in the street. So what's flowering over time? What's, what's giving uh, nectar? What's providing shelter over time? Is there something missing so that you won't be able to achieve your biodiversity goals? And Casey, who's, who's one of the people who works on the project, he's actually a designer by training who's done an ecological PhD, but he's really good at figures and design work. We're so lucky. <laughs> um, he developed this kind of summary score of what, what it would look like if you had um, your street evaluated according to canopy cover, the structure of the vegetation, the diversity of the vegetation, the nativeness, how connected it is, and what sort of seeding that's providing resources. And this is kind of, we're hoping that developers are going to actually find this quite interesting and use it when they're, when they're putting, planning their palette, planting palette, so that we can have much more diverse um, resource provision in our streetscapes. And of course, we can provide habitat through analogues. It's beautiful. You probably all know it. Um, enchanting bird observatory in Jerusalem that was designed to actually have birds nesting in the walls. Well, we can do that in all sorts of contexts. We can do it with water. That's something we're working on a lot now, is trying to combine water sensitive and biodiversity sensitive M design. Because, you know, water sensitive M design is meant to be about nature, but it doesn't really have much nature really built into the process. So you can have a lot of water sensitive and design. It's very poor for, for biodiversity. Let's flip this around and try and make sure that the objectives are aligned. Or, or having just walls that are intentionally designed for, um, you know, to be nature friendly and enhancing just as a standard part of your kind of design, streetscape design. I've showed this to you guys before potentially, but this is, I just think this is such a beautiful concept. It's a brick in a building where birds can nest on one side and people can watch them nesting but through the perspex on the other side. <laughs> that's, that's enchantment with nature. Designing away threats is the real trick, I think. Um, reducing barriers to, to uh, connectivity, and thinking about the sorts of things that, that happen in cities. I had told Wolfgang this sad story, but I was jogging home uh, yesterday morning, I think it was, been up on the hill and I was jogging back to my apartment, my, my uh, hotel, and a little bird had actually just smashed into the glass of a kind of business on that main street of uh, Fising. And I picked it up, it was still warm. I think it was a tree creeper. I don't know, my son's been trying to help me in Wolfgang. I think we think it was a beautiful little tree creeper. And it was, yeah, anyway, then I actually thought, well, I better bury it and, you know, give it a bit of a nice end to its life. And so I just tried to find some dirt to bury this bird in. <laughs> and I had to walk such a long way to find a bit of dirt to bury this bird. And I thought, this street near has got some greening issues. <laughs> Anyway, that aside, uh, we need to think of ways that we have glass that doesn't 
is not a threat to birds. We there's an innovation that seems pretty simple. We tilt glass, the birds see the ground, not the sky, and they don't fly into it. But there's also all sorts of um, biodiversity friendly glass that we don't use enough. Architects just need to, it needs to be standard practice. Patios. This is a way that we should build into our houses spaces for animals to be able to you know, have their fun outside, but aren't a threat to wildlife. It's called a patio. Um, wildlife friendly lighting. This is something we're seeing a big uptake in Australia. I don't know if it's happening here very much, but it's very simple. It's about just changing the wavelength of light. That means that all sorts of species are no longer impacted as much by light, nighttime lighting, or even just angling lights. So they're not actually just wasting light into the surrounding landscape. I think I've got to probably wrap up pretty quickly, but we're also working on building codes. So thinking really carefully about a house that has all these things incorporated, the window treatments, the habitat bricks, the, you know, the mix of the three the living wall, the rooftop gardens, the, um, shielded lighting, et cetera, and, and trying to get some of our big mainstream developers to provide this as a sort of option for people when they go and look at their um, at their sort of, um, what do they call it? The open houses where you go to, you go to these new developments and you can go and explore a house and decide which one you're going to have built. We, we're designing one of these that they can have as an option, a biodiversity friendly house. And then connectivity, obviously a huge one we think, um, how you design so that <laughs> the species can get access to all these wonderful resources that you're providing. And, you know, species are pretty different in the way they perceive barriers. And you guys are doing some wonderful work in, over here in your group, just trying to unpack exactly what a barrier looks like for a bird, an insect, you know, a lizard, a slug. It's going to be quite different the way they perceive the landscape and probably on very different scales as well. This is an uplifting story. This is a kind of underpass on a highway that was put in, in, in Queensland. And these are some pictures of all the extraordinary animal, animals, kangaroos, wallabies. This is a goanna, the gigantic snake slaughter. They all used it. It was actually really successful. So this is just a, this is Southern Cross University, a really lovely case study of how we can do this. And then positive human interactions, probably the most important part of biodiversity sensitive urban design, how you get people to live in these places, love them, not want to rip the plants out, have the, as big a part of their personal identity living in this place, wanting to be stewards. I think this is our key challenge, isn't it? Uh, obviously thinking about carefully about urban form because with certain types of urban form are going to be able to provide these experiences and this, in, you know, and these nature doses, others are less likely to be able to provide it. You've got to hone in on those urban forms and really encourage them and discourage the others. So I have a lot of slides about measuring, but I think I've actually run out of time. So I don't know if we can, is that right? Or should I quickly go through the, five minutes. yeah, five minutes, I can do it. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, you're probably all a bit tired. It is like nearly six o'clock. Okay. Measuring is also super important and very challenging. We all know this. How do we demonstrate that our plan is actually going to, I think, Stefan, you were talking to me before, earlier, how do we know that things are going to persist on this site when we've gone to all this effort, cost, community engagement? How depressing if we build it and the blue tongue lizard never comes and it just gets squashed on roads and you know, it was folly. So we need to have some confidence that we're actually going to succeed in this game. So even before we've built it, we need to plan and measure what the likely success of our actions are going to be. We do this a lot with connectivity modelling. So this is an example where the city of Melbourne, um, actually this is a kind of planning tool. Uh, they really they were, came to us and said, what we want to do is increase the ecological connectivity for a uh, particular insect, a particular uh, lizard, a particular bird, a bat, maybe two bats, that's unusual. Um, but it was a whole bunch of species. And they said, where should we be investing in our green infrastructure development in, in Melbourne to increase this connectivity? So this is a larger scale 
plan, but it really showed that there were some absolute um, hotspots of barriers in the city, that if you could increase the ecological resources provided in those places and, and decrease some of the other key barriers, maybe through some of those innovative road designs or what have you, then you could probably increase the connectivity of this site quite a lot. I know that I know that you um, and you've got some really great thoughts on connectivity that you know better still better to think about this more at a, a, a sort of smaller scale. Um, but I think this is also potentially a good motivating planning tool to get investment at a larger scale in, in green infrastructure. We use sometimes we use really detailed models, sometimes we don't have the time or data to do that. We use a really quite cool expert elicitation process. So I get everyone in the room who knows about grasslands. This is one of my favorite ecosystems in the world, the basalt plains grasslands of Melbourne. Less than 1% of it left. It's really beautiful, enchanting, but you have to get down on the ground, the bottom in the air to be able to appreciate it. So politicians never do. <laughs> Pretty clean danger, so many threats. And you know, we wanted to know what do we really need to do in sites that have grasslands to make sure that we've got some chance of persisting. So we got the experts together and we unpacked all the different things that we could possibly do. And they, they helped us focus in on some very important aspects that we've probably not, not thought about much um, to do. Things like early protection. If you're going to have a development nearby, you've got to protect the site, make sure it doesn't have uh, uh, impacted soils and, and, and uh, all sorts of weeds coming in, et cetera. Anyway, this is one simple approach that can, we think, really help guide the likelihood of persistence. But then there's detailed population modelling too. And I, look, this is a terrible time of night to be talking about something that's actually quite technical and that's a little boring to people. But essentially what you're trying to do is capture the biology of a species into a few formula. <laughs> so this here is a legless lizard. I think I saw a legless lizard with you on my first day, Wolfgang. Is that right? We, I think we saw a legless lizard on the first day in, in, yeah. in Friesen being eaten by a crow. Which is a bit sad. But these, these again, are uh, critically, well, nationally threatened. I think they're, yeah, they're endangered. Um, they look a bit like a snake, even though they're not snakes. They're really cute. And they, they hide under bits of um, rocks. And, and you can actually create these um, hotels, uh, these, these um, little guys, and they, they like to sort of sleep under them. So they're easy to kind of create habitat for. But we knew that there were some big threats like cats, and we wanted to try and capture that in a population model. And we found that if you had, if you did anything about cats, you really had this close to a 60% chance that the thing was going to persist over a period of, I think it was 50 years or something. If you dealt with the cats, had some slight habitat improvements, thought about some corridors, then you could bump it up to nearly 100% chance. Look, I'm not sure if I entirely believe that, but Certainly that's what the model was suggesting, that we had a dramatically increased chance of this thing persisting. And I actually don't see why not. If you've got the habitat for it, you're protecting it from threats. It can, it can easily thrive. So, but these are really quite cool because it just, it focuses the attention on things that are ecologically gonna be critical for the survival of that species. And maybe let's developers know that, hey, there might be some things you can get away with not doing. I love that. <laughs> anyway, just to conclude, I think the key to biodiversity sense of urban design is doing it where people are in the in the streetscapes, in the you know, in the roundabouts, in the green green walls, green roofs, in the schoolyards, and you know, university campuses. Hint, hint. <laughs> um, no, you've got some wonderful nature on this campus. You're very lucky. Uh, yes, big green spaces, riverside vegetation. They're going to be really critical corridors, critical places for investment. But um, we need to think much more about the urban matrix as a place for nature. Um, and I think our challenge is finding the space for it and, you know, really coming up with intentional, enchanting designs that are really going to deliver a vision like this. Thank you very much.
Find out more about our research on www.ecolopes.org and on our social media platforms.